Hi, I'm Bill Vales here with another edition of Your Backyard. And for this edition of Your Backyard, instead of touring one of Littleton's fine conservation trails, I thought it'd be interesting to take a walk through our backyard, Carol and my backyard here in Littleton, and see what we find. And hopefully this will pique your interest to go out into your backyard and to appreciate the flora, fauna, and geology. Now, for this show on Your Backyard, I have a special guest that has uh, uh, come up. And what do I hear behind me? Here's, here comes my special guest. Hi, Bill. Uh, hi, Julie, how, how are, are you? Great. Good to see you. Great to see you. Yep. Well, I'm here with Julie Kazmarsik, who's up from... Virginia. Vir Virginia. And uh, have you been up in this part of the woods before? Well, uh, I was um, born in Connecticut, and I'm your sister. Oh. And uh, yes, we no, have yeah. been acquainted for quite some okay, time so, now. So, so you're familiar then with New England, the flora, the fauna. And, Always happy and coming home. Grew up in Stowe. Went to Neshoba. Very familiar with New England. Great, great. You've provided the show with some beautiful pictures of uh, birds and uh, wildlife and we really appreciate that. Happy to do it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're great. And um, I thought it'd be interesting for us to walk out through our property mm -hmm. here and um, take a look at uh, different things that we find. Yeah. Take advantage of your birding eyes and birding ears. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, um, see what we find. Now, to introduce uh, uh, to the folks, we are located in an area called Scratch Flat. And that name comes from um, John Mitchell in a book that he wrote called mm -hmm. Ceremonial Time. And this area, it's about one square mile of, of, of land he wrote about, and he, he brought it back about 15,000 years. Um, he he uh, referred to as Scratch Flat. So we're pretty much dead center on Scratch Flat, and I have that from uh, John Mitchell. Okay. So, um, so what's your uh, sea level here? The sea yeah. level here. You're going to start asking questions like I that. I am right away. Okay. <laughs> I'm just I, curious. I happen to know that that at the wellhead, it's 111 feet mm -hmm. above sea level because in the well below it's about a hundred and a hundred and three so we're roughly 111 okay. feet above sea level so we're in a fairly flat area mm -hmm. of the uh, so-called penny plain okay. which is a, geo a geological term to describe the you know of really a vast plain that uh, we're in that you really get a striking view of if you were standing on Mount Monadnock looking this way, you'd see how flat. Which I hiked it, many times growing up yep. as a Girl Scout and uh, was out early this morning uh, scoping out some of the birds and uh, getting a little oriented with um, where we are. So we have the sun up there now. We're what, around 9, 9, yeah, it's around, early. Around, so around 9 a.m. Must be. Yeah. North over North here. is is right over here. Okay. Which would put south behind us, mm -hmm. um, west and east. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because the hill that we're on, where we're located, is mm -hmm. uh, Proctor Hill. Okay. okay. And Proctor Hill is a drumlin that's uh, in, in town that that is between uh, Route 119 mm -hmm. and uh, Hartwell Road. And the drumlin runs. Uh, north to south, which would be consistent with the glacial movement. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, so that's kind of the orientation of uh, where we are. So um, why don't we um, take a walk and um, look at some stuff. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Julie, we've walked over to the other side of the property here. And what sort of pointers would you give the audience about how to best get oriented to to uh, uh, learning about what's in your yard? Good question, Bill. Um, <clears> the <throat> most obvious thing is you need to step out of the house. You can't just 
learn about nature and your yard by watching things on TV. Mm -hmm. You actually need to get outside, walk around, don't just look down. You want to look up, you want to look all around. Um, I notice you have a really good diversity of trees. Um, different types of trees lend themselves to different species of birds, uh, mammals sitting out on your uh, front stoop this morning. Saw chipmunks, squirrels, uh, rabbits. Um, Tons of rabbits this year. Lots of rabbits. Um, you have lots of different plantings, which will attract uh, different insects, which then will attract different birds. And you'll learn that this whole circle is connected. And um, when I first started out in nature, I guess the thing I was most drawn to was birding. But once you look at a bird, you see the bird sitting on a tree. And then you're curious, well, what is that tree? Mm -hmm. Uh, see a hummingbird go to a flower, you know, what kind of flower is it? Uh, flowers will attract butterflies. Yep. Then next thing you know, you're um, accumulating field guides of butterflies, insects, birds. Yep. So uh, to sum it up, get outside, look all around, uh, try not to focus on just one species, just be aware of your your whole environment. Yeah, I found sometimes going out birding because I've, I've birded a long time myself and how I got started was seeing a Peterson field guide on our father's uh, table mm -hmm. at a very young age mm -hmm. and I remember just thumbing through that seeing these beautiful pictures mm -hmm. of um, uh, birds and that that really got me into it. Um, but I found sometimes birding I will actually go out without binoculars because I want to see the whole, the whole environment because mm -hmm. sometimes um, binoculars get you focusing very, you know, small or if you take, if you like taking pictures, sometimes the whole activity can be photography right? as opposed to looking at what's, what's outside. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, canopy here, mm -hmm. and it is fairly diverse, and um, mm -hmm. um, we have a lot on this property here. There's a lot of red oak. You can see the red oak in front, mm -hmm. a lot of white pine. You know, the white pine are fairly tall. I'm always reminded how tall they are in a windstorm because they're pretty close sure. to the house. Yep. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, hickory. Uh, there's a lot of pignut hickory and a lot of shagbark hickory, and it just so happens that right here, this is a shagbark hickory, mm -hmm. and this is a typical species that you'll see in Littleton, and uh, we also see uh, on this property, and you can see mm -hmm. the shag yeah. bark here. Right. And next to this shagbark hickory is a pignut hickory. Yeah, I just saw a nut down here. Yep. Yeah. This is one of last year's That's pretty nuts. Good. <laughs> and the uh, hang on there. No problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is live. Uh, so these pig nuts are um, small and and they're green. Mm -hmm. I saw some the other day. I don't know where they've gone, or maybe I do know where they've gone. They've gone down these holes because mm -hmm. these look like chipmunk holes. Oh yeah, and you are loaded with chipmunks. Yeah, and we're mm -hmm. loaded with chipmunks this year. I'm looking at three right now. So I bet they've um, mm -hmm. collected these. But over here, we have a pignut hickory. So you can see... Um, Big one. Quite, quite large. Mm -hmm. Two different species of, uh, mm -hmm. of um, hickory side mm -hmm. by side. Yeah. And, you know, for that reason, I would never cut them because just to have them side by side, I think, is, is um, uh, kind of neat. I just want to go back to the word canopy. Um, for those people who aren't that active in bird watching, uh, the canopy. Uh, is the upper level of the trees and there's a lot of birds that are primarily canopy feeders. 
Um, and you'll see this mostly in the springtime when we get all the migratory warblers mm -hmm. and vireos uh, coming through <clears throat> from Central and South America that just come up here for a short stay breed and then go back down. Yeah, we think of them as our birds, but they're really just visiting. They're just visiting. Yeah. And um, I'll show photos to people and they'll say, oh, well, those birds don't come to my feeders. It's like because they are not seed eating birds. Um, they feed primarily on insects, yeah. um, which are up in the canopy. So yeah. um, I remember up at uh, U Lowell when I was a student, um, had a poster in my room and it just said, you observe a lot by watching, which means just get out there, look, yeah. you don't even have to move, just yeah. let the birds and, and wildlife come yeah, to you. Absolutely. Uh, I've heard people say, you know, I've mentioned that I see uh, Baltimore Orioles or Northern Orioles. I don't know which name yeah. you, you go by. I like Baltimore. Baltimore Orioles. Not the team, just and, the uh, bird. And, and, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, they say, well, you know, I don't see them around our house. But I hear them every year, mm -hmm. predictably, at the same time of the year, early spring. But they're in the tops of the trees. Mm -hmm. They come in at the tops of the trees. And uh, I can always hear that, that five note, very melodious mm -hmm. uh, call, and, uh, or song, I should mm -hmm. say. And um, that's where they are. They're not going to be at that level. Exactly. You know. Uh, and of course, some of the birds, when they first come in, once the leaves come in, it's very difficult to start. Advantage bird. Ab yeah. Absolutely. The advantage goes to the yeah. birds that yeah. uh, they're, they're, um, they have cover. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely to their to their advantage. So. And interesting, you mentioned you will hear the Baltimore Oriole or different birds in the same spot, which I find year after year um, with different species um, down in our home in Virginia. Um, there's a concept or phenomenon, whatever you call it, called nest fidelity, and birds are. Um, faithful to a nest site and many of them will return to uh, their natal box which is mm -hmm. natal as in prenatal birth um, they'll go back to where they were born or mm -hmm. they will go back to where you know they first had a nest and yeah, interesting. so that is perhaps yeah. one of the reasons that you hear um, birds in the same spot yeah yeah and, and that I happens to me yeah. year after year yeah. and and perhaps we'll, we'll show people a sample of that with our, uh, the Phoebe nest that Carol and I get mm -hmm. in the tractor shed mm -hmm. every year same place yeah uh, they alternate between one or two lights but yeah. uh, they're there yeah, my husband uh, and I uh, your brother-in-law uh, Mike and I have the same thing with the Phoebe yeah um, goes to the same post year after year yeah. and, uh, so one uh, thing that I noticed just behind you here that I thought would be oh interesting my. to... Oh, um, That's interesting. Yeah. I tried to sell this um, to my grandkids as a dinosaur bone, and yeah, now no. that they've gotten older, they... That's at least a few million years old. Yeah, they don't uh, quite uh, uh, <laughs> buy this. But what I found probably... Um, oh. um I don't know. It it's must big. have been 10 years ago. This is my gauge. This is eight and a half inches. Yeah. So okay, add that's on a good... another five. So this is, you know, a foot plus. Yeah. So what I heard when I showed this to a, mm -hmm. a, a local biologist, uh, uh, actually, uh, a local farmer in town that's no longer with us, he knew right away that this was a cow, I don't know, fibia, tibia, <laughs> you know, help me out here. You're a nurse. Um, well, not today. I'm off duty. <laughs> okay. Um, See, and uh, maybe you know, of course, maybe it's a femur. <laughs> okay, femur. Oh, I don't know. That that's good. <laughs> Look at that. Okay. Um, that you know, we're surrounded by farms here. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and that uh, a lot of these farms have uh, various animals, cows. And if a cow dies, mm -hmm. you know, they tend to, actually what they tend to do, I've heard, is they throw it in a uh, 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 compost bin to or, aid in the... Uh, or a pit. Yep. Or a pit or something mm -hmm. like that. And um, the farmer felt that, uh, the biologist felt that this was probably pulled out of the pit by a coyote. Sure. Brought over... Um, to our land, and there's still been gnawing. Look well, at, look. and the gnawing is probably from a mouse. Oh. Uh, we find uh, shed deer antlers, and the mice like to chew on it, get calcium. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, sadness that, you know, dead cow, but it's benefiting Other, the rest of the environment. Uh, yeah, so let's go looking at some other places. All right. Well, here we are. We walked a little deeper into the woods. Yeah, 10 um, steps. Yep. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you really don't have to go far for, for a change because mm -hmm. if you look around, right. the trees have really changed. We, we, we have a lot of white pine here mm -hmm. and also pitch pine. And you can see they have the different, the different pine cones for mm -hmm. one thing. This is white pine. This is pitch pine. Mm -hmm. You have both these species in uh, mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, Virginia. Right. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's more that differentiate them other than the pine cones. But Pines, great trees for um, uh, bald eagles prefer nesting in pines. Uh, great horned owls um, seem to be preferred okay. nesting trees. So. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, you get familiar with what types of trees. You can hone in on maybe what to expect in some of those trees. That's a great, uh, <clears throat> a great tip. Um, I'm a fan of bird boxes. I have mm -hmm. a lot of uh, bird boxes. I think about 15, and um, I've given up trying to keep these in pristine shape. Mm -hmm. uh, they get destroyed. Um, various animals live in them. Um, I, I originally intended to have bluebirds in them, but you really don't have a lot of control, do you? No. Over who moves in no. and who doesn't. So I check these boxes twice a year. Um, this box I have not checked since um, winter, so I don't know, or mm -hmm. last fall maybe. Okay. So I don't know what's living in it if if anything so i've always been surprised by bird boxes as i have <laughs> as what comes out i mean you could have snakes you yep. could have bees ticks um i've had a bat in a bluebird box that would uh take a year or two off my life um you just never know what's uh, uh going to come out. So and you mentioned not keeping them in pristine condition. When you think about it, the cavity nesters, and this is a cavity, yep. they would be nesting in a tree, which right. is not in pristine condition. That's right. So, I mean, there's there's a level of pristineness, so right. to speak. Right. Um, you know, if you have a roof that's falling off, it's, it's not doing a whole lot for the bird. Yeah. But basically, if they have an enclosed space and they're um, safe from the weather, you're, you're doing them a favor. Yeah. Now, I found that some of, some uh, bird boxes you can spend enormous amounts of money on. And some will go to the uh, trouble, uh, some builders, they'll put um, uh, nice copper roofs on them that get real hot. Real hot. And they're very slick. Yeah. And there's nothing to mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, grip onto. Mm -hmm. And while you have a beautiful looking bird box, you'll probably have no birds. True. Maybe. So. Um, and a lot so of boxes are made, uh, sorry to interrupt, I just, I mean, you just get my mind thinking because yeah. I just love birds, but a lot of bird boxes you'll find at craft shows or, you know, different gift shops will look really cute, but they don't even have a way to open the box. And I'm going to yeah. show you one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you'll also see them uh, made out of pressure treated wood. 
Yeah. Not the healthiest choice of material for no. a bird. So let's see what's in here. And here's what I do. I got my grandkids doing this now. I always knock on these things. Grandkids, wow, yeah. they're pretty old. Oh yeah, <laughs> always knock on these, which is really the right thing to do when you're going to someone's mm -hmm. house. Okay, mm -hmm. and a lot of times whatever's in there will just hunker down. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, mm -hmm. and want you to go away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at least now we're beyond the point of startling them. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you the honors of uh, so yours is a uh, opening that it opens from the bottom with the hinge up here. So if you pull that, this is I'm pulling this pin. Okay. Oh, oh. yeah, I'm always <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've done it for years, but I'm always <laughs> okay. There's lots of stuff in All there. All right, it's been a busy nest. Yep. And so there's different layers. Uh, well, I don't know how old it is, but you know this may have started to degrade. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of almost looks like some plant fiber. Um, I don't know if it's you know given way to dust. I mean, I mean a mouse could still jump out of here. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Now. The materials being used, certain birds like certain materials. Absolutely. I've had in years past flying squirrels shoot out of here. Yep. Um, so I, I've sort of given up on this box having any birds in it. Mm -hmm. I always expect flying squirrels in here. And I'm kind of thinking in a Virginia frame of mind as far as calendar time and our breeding season for most cavity nesters. Um, cavity nester versus a nest. Um, there's birds that nest in cavities, which is a box mm -hmm. or a hole in a tree, or birds that build a nest. Um, so your chickadees, titmice, bluebirds, um, those are cavity nesters. Uh, cardinals, blue jays, goldfinches, those would not be cavity nesters. And and a few nuts in here. Now, if a box is full, Mm -hmm. and it's not emptied out from year to year, will uh, certain birds tend to reject that box? Do they expect uh, a, clean, uh, a clean place? Or um, I do a lot of work with a warbler, which is the only cavity nesting warbler on the East Coast, which is a prothonotary warbler. I don't believe you guys get them up here. But I monitor about 165 nest boxes um, by canoe because they nest in boxes over water. And we've noticed that if we don't get to the box in time and the birds have already had a brood and they've fledged, they will build a nest on a nest. A nest on a nest. Um, same species. The same species. Yeah. Uh, Prothonotaries, yeah. right. Um, we have seen them build a nest on top of a tree swallow nest, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking with something like this, it might be rejected. You know, okay. it's like, it's enough, there's too much stuff in there, and you know, then it's going to attract more bugs. Yeah. Some birds are tidier than others, um, like bluebirds are, are very... Immaculate nest. Immaculate. Yeah. They, when they're little ones, you know, poop. They will carry out their fecal sac, which is yep. a little enclosed white sac. And for survivorship, they drop that fecal sac far away from the box so as not to alert predators wow. that I have babies in the box. Interesting. So to answer your question, with all this stuff, you know, other than a mouse, I would not expect oh. you to s see a Look bird. Look at this. Oh, an egg. An egg. <laughs> An egg. Look at that. Look at that. Yep. Well, I may be able to tell you more about what it isn't. I know it's not a chickadee. Mm -hmm. I know it's not a bluebird. Yeah, and what tells you that? Um, well, a bluebird egg is typically um, blue. Um, they can have a white egg. A chickadee egg is very small, round. This is a like an oblong egg. Mm -hmm. um, it may be a titmouse egg. 
Um, yeah, that's one to look up. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Now, I think this is... Oh, it's got a hole in it. Yeah. So... So I'm relieved we didn't destroy we did an active not. nest. But the nest yeah. really didn't look no. active. Um, and one thing to... So we're going to look at tip mice. Determine the viability of eggs is in a cup of water, if you put the egg in and it floated, it's no good. Oh. If it sinks, it's good. But okay. don't try it in a river because your egg's gone for good. Um, <laughs> and there's the hole in it. I'm sure our videographer will get a great picture of that. So I'm thinking this is more mouse mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe flying squirrel. Okay. Do you know the shape of this egg? You can do a whole show on an egg. The, the shape of this egg, from what I've learned, is this way because it'll always roll towards the center of the nest. Hmm. Now, now, I learned that at the Isles of Shoals by uh, a lady that uh, gave a presentation on gulls. Uh -huh. That the, the, the geometry of that egg, mm -hmm. you know, as they move that around, it will tend to go oh, in the center of the nest. I hadn't so, heard that one. So, anyway. Yeah. Um, something to note about this, um, put that right there, this box is it has this, this little block here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is a predator guard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a raccoon, which would, or, well, yeah, a raccoon, mm -hmm. which would love sticking its. It's like a hand. Like a hand yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. This extends the reach they need, and they right. can't get to the nest. And on the inside here, you notice these lines that have been mm -hmm. put in, and uh, actually they're not lines; they're, they're little. Uh, they've been routed out or mm -hmm. something ga gouged out. That gives, um, you know, something that a bird can... The young can, ones to hop can, out, can help them. Hop out. So, yep. so very interesting. So an egg, that's pretty an neat. Egg. That's okay. great. Okay, yeah. so let's continue on. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're walking on our way down towards uh, where it gets a little wetter and mm -hmm. there's some more boxes, but I wanted to stop here. Uh, because normally we get what's called Indian pipe here. Do you see any of that in Virginia? I do. Uh, we've, I've seen it out in the uh, Piedmont area, which is uh, further west in Virginia. Yep. And I've seen it in the coastal plain uh, down near the Chesapeake Bay. Yep. And uh, it's always a treat to see it. It is. It is. And they're uh, shaped like a pipe. Mm-hmm. Was that a red-tailed hawk that I heard up there? Uh, we'll get back to that. Yeah, we will. I'm okay. hearing a lot of other things. Okay. Uh, a lot of goldfinch and. Uh, um, but the Indian pipe, it's it's bright white. And, right. And why is it white? Uh, it's white uh, because there is no chlorophyll in it. Chlorophyll, which is in all our green plants. Thanks for the green. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't recall, I thought it was about this time of the year mm -hmm. I start seeing uh, Indian pipe here, but we've been in such a drought mm -hmm. uh, this year that it may, you know, change the timing of certain things. I know we saw Indian pipe in uh, New Hampshire, northern New Hampshire, mm -hmm. last week, which, you know, I, I got some pictures of. but. Uh, just to give the audience some sense of the variety of um, beautiful vegetation mm -hmm. we have here, we have some uh, um, larger ferns. Yeah, I, beautiful. I think these are royal ferns. I, I think these are royal ferns, and we see on the property, and we'll see them in other places. Mm -hmm. We have royal ferns. Ostrich ferns, cinnamon ferns, and uh, I think they're called polypody okay. ferns. Uh, but we'll look at those. But we have low bush, low bush blueberry. Nice. Say that three times fast. Yep. And this may, 
Hello. be one of the things that attracted bear here. Mm -hmm. We had a large bear on our property um, just in the backyard, actually, mm. very near the back porch. Wow. Um, about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, they like berries. Yep. So these are all low bush, low bush blueberries here, and they kind of dot the whole area. And I see them all throughout Littleton. We don't have a huge harvest yet. I see no, one berry. You see one, yeah. You know, <laughs> um, but I think we're going to start, hopefully, start seeing more. And they'll attract a lot of birds. Yeah. I sure, yeah. surely have a bumper crop of chipmunks everywhere well, I look. I'm seeing chipmunks. <laughs> there's a lot of chipmunks and a lot of rabbits. Yeah. In addition to the uh, blueberries, we also have some black raspberry here. And uh, in addition I, to the blueberry, yeah, the the, the blueberry. single blueberry. Yes, we that have we saw. Uh, three yeah, raspberries. We have no. some black raspberries. Yes. But actually, um, when I first moved into this property, mm -hmm. it was loaded with black raspberry in the field. You couldn't use the field; it was just a tangle mm -hmm. of briars and everything. So I'm glad to see some of the um, mm -hmm. uh, black raspberry come come back, I know that that will attract wildlife. Sure. Uh, birds, and um, I don't know if bears like them, but it wouldn't surprise me. It certainly wouldn't surprise me. Um, well, it's interesting that, with bears, you know, it's such a big mammal, uh, yet what they eat are the smallest of things. Grubs, yes. ants, yeah. seeds, berries, yeah. you know, and uh, not the carnivore that, that you would think. You right. know, they're uh, I guess they would be an omnivore, but they they tend to be a little bit more vegetarian. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. uh, that's true. I think they are classified as an omnivore. Um, I'm reminded of the disparity in size between um, whales, you know, sifting the um, uh, the almost microscopic organisms mm -hmm. through the baleen. Mm -hmm. You know, the smallest right. uh, mm -hmm. things to eat by yeah. the largest mammal. So that, that's a good point. Right. What I have behind me here is actually a beautiful bush, but it is an invasive species. It's a burning bush, and it turns bright red in the um, fall. Mm -hmm. And these can really overrun an area. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, um, you really need to take care uh, to not let them do that. Well, we're over here now by a couple of our bird feeders that we have. And uh, there seems to be a lot of activity mm -hmm. at the feeders. I've seen some cardinals this morning, a couple mm -hmm. cardinals. What else have you seen? Uh, I've seen um, American goldfinch, black-capped chickadees, uh, white-breasted nuthatch, house finch. Uh, downy woodpecker, ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, the best birds, or the most bird activity you'll see is first thing in the morning, um, you know, just at first light and, and right after um, when they're, you know, doing their first feeding for the day and before the, the big heat of the day. Um, I mean, you have a lot of natural food sources here sure. that you're supplementing them. What kind of things are you you feeding, Bill? We go through uh, black oiled sunflower seed, mm -hmm. uh, probably 200 pounds, 250 pounds a year. Maybe. That's all. <laughs> maybe more. I don't know. Uh, then I also have in that long feeder there uh, thistle, thistle seed. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, goldfinch like that. And if mm -hmm. we get pine siskin, Mm -hmm. They seem to like it, and some other birds will try to get their beak in there. Right. Uh, but certainly the American goldfinch and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, pine siskins like it. And then I have suet, and uh, the squirrels love that. I'm yeah. always in a constant fight with the squirrels sure. uh, to uh, keep them off the feeders. That's why I have these things here, mm -hmm. and you know they're moderately successful. Um, more, uh, more chipmunks. Yeah, chipmunks over there. Uh, 
And then the, but, you have the cage around the tube feeders, which yes. makes it um, kind of safe for just the small birds to get in and, and keep the squirrels out. Yeah, and what I've also found is we have a, um, I believe it's a Cooper's hawk that mm -hmm. will come in every day, every other day, and it'll make a swoop. Sure. That's something uh, uh, by the feeders. And mm -hmm. every now and then, Carol or I will see a puff of feathers. Yep. Odds are it's a morning dove yep. uh, that the uh, Cooper hawk has, has got. We have red-tailed hawks that come through, but they tend not to attack the birds at the feeders. Um, uh, so, so those cages give a little bit of protection, too. Mm -hmm. um, the Cooper's we do, hawks we have as well, and Sharpshin hawks, and you know, some people could argue that your bird feeders are a buffet. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I, that everybody has to eat. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I understand that criticism, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I continue to have bird feeders. Oh, we have more so, than I can count. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, what we've um, had that happens to us a lot is birds are always running into our windows. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll hear throughout the day, thump, you know, and I'll always go out and look to see if something has fallen down. Mm -hmm. And just the other day, we had a bird that knocked itself silly. Mm -hmm. So um, I went out, I picked the bird up, and this bird looked like it really drank too much. The night before, mm -hmm. and we uh, picked it up, sort of put it in a safe place, mm -hmm. and it rested for probably a half an hour, mm -hmm. which I thought was a long time, but it eventually took off. Uh, but uh, I was glad that we could uh, make a simple contribution. And most of those birds uh, happens at our home. They hit the window, you hear a big thud, I do the same thing, look out the window, go outside, there lays the bird. It's kind of like a bell ringer, yep. and best thing to do is, um, you know, if you're so inclined, pick it up, keep it warm, keep it in a, a confined space with air circulation, quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, don't attempt to give it seed or anything. Right. Just keep it quiet yeah. and chances are, you know, it'll come to its senses and you can yeah. just let it go. Yeah. And something else I learned too when I bird banded, and I know you bird band a lot, which mm -hmm. I want to talk about, but when you um, uh, have a bird that's in a bag getting ready to be processed, mm -hmm. and this is a, a similar sort of thing, don't put it on the ground where you might step on it. Correct. You know, best to put it mm -hmm. in an area where you're not walking. Oh, yeah. Because that could I'll make it not a pretty Hang pretty it on different. my belt, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, of which you do ban a lot of birds. You mentioned before that you ban prothonotary wobblers. Mm -hmm. um, and you've been involved in the study of them for years, right? Uh, probably a decade now. A decade. Mm -hmm. A decade now. Mm -hmm. So, you've been building up various types of information on mm -hmm. migratory tr trends mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, it, information like that has to has to enter into contribute to understanding climate mm -hmm. vegetation changes yep have uh, traveled to uh, Panama where they overwinter and mm -hmm. have netted them down there had hoped to net one with one of our bands uh, oh. sadly um, in Panama, they're, they weren't as attuned to uh, banding projects as we are, but we offered a lot of education, and that's starting up down there. Mm -hmm. um, we have an incredible recovery of adult prothonotary warblers that can be seven, eight, nine years old, wow. and they return to the exact same box wow. from Costa Rica, Panama, to Chester, Virginia. Mm. Um, well, what a treat to find a ban. Oh, it that, is. That, yeah. yeah. The only places, I, I've seen prothonotaries with you. Mm -hmm. you. You took me out kayaking mm -hmm. once uh, uh, in Virginia. And as you said, they're, they're cavity nesters. Mm -hmm. But I have seen a prothonotary wobbler up here, and I've seen it with Carol. 
and I'm sure Carol remembers, um, up at Plum Island, which wow. is a great place to yeah. see all different types of Absolutely. birds up in uh, Newburyport, Mass. Mm -hmm. um, so look at this, we have two, uh, they kind of look young. They do. They They're, look like young chickadees. Uh, little black capped chickadees. I keep wanting to say Carolina chickadees, but I'm a little north now, so yeah. these are black capped. So you see um, Carolina chickadees? Mm -hmm. Okay. And in the western part of Virginia and West Virginia, we would see black capped. Mm -hmm. Okay, black capped. Well, we see up in northern New Hampshire black capped chickadees and boreal. Mm hmm chickadees which have That's kind a of treat. a brown right. cap mm -hmm. and their call is somewhat lethargic it's much slower <laughs> uh -huh. than the black cap chickadee so that's a, a pretty good clue sure. of um, what we're seeing so um, and you were asking um, you know about what I banned uh, also have um, a project banding northern sawwet owls, which are migratory. Uh, they come down from Canada, northern New England, and they have continued on as far south as Alabama and Georgia. And we seriously believe after over a decade of banding these owls uh, that some overwinter in Virginia. Oh. And uh, there's not as big a thrill as uh, catching an owl in your net that has somebody else's band. And I've caught them from Manitoba. Um, right here um, at Drumlin Farm, they have a uh, sawwet project yep, there yep. in our um, our study group. And um, yeah, birds from New York City, Pennsylvania. Um, yeah. yeah, it's very I know exciting. you're out all hours of the night all days <laughs> of the year in swamps and woods and uh -huh. um, doing this and it's uh, it's pretty neat it's clearly your passion you you have a banding license I have a federal I we have a master bander and then we are all sub permit permittees uh, but I with that said, I have a federal and a state banding license, as well as a salvage permit, which allows me to collect feathers, nests. I could take that egg, mm -hmm. um, which the general public is is not allowed yeah. to just pick up a feather. Yeah, and you can't pick up a feather. Really, not supposed nests, to. Nests. Nests. Eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Did you pick that egg up before, or was that me? Uh, that was you. Oh, that was me. And uh, okay, let's see, Chief, I, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, a salvage license. Um, interesting term. Mm -hmm. Interesting term. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, I think um, we're going to wrap up this show, mm -hmm. and we're going to do another show to go a little further into the woods. Okay. Uh, into our, at the uh, base of our glacial drumlin, and um, we'll look for some other things. So, enjoying it. I hope you found this uh, show informative and join us on our next show.